Welcome back, students, to our next uh, lesson in introductory psychology. Uh, uh, and again, a very important one, one that we could spend uh, uh, days, weeks, hours, even years studying. Uh, but we're, we're going to uh, confine this into uh, uh, the next hour, conditioning and learning. Everything that I am, you are, everybody is, has been learned. You, you, you start learning from age zero, perhaps even earlier than that. There's some research uh, uh, with uh, relative to embryonic learning, and I don't mean learning like studying a, a book and learning calculus or something. Learning occurs in many, many different domains. Uh, uh, and some of it, a lot of it, we're not even aware uh, uh, going on. Uh, but we learn, one learns, uh, every single microsecond of existence. Uh, learning is going on. And when learning uh, goes on, change occurs. So uh, 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 even if you are just downright insistent upon uh, uh, not changing, I'm sorry, it's not working, and your uh, uh, goal has failed because uh, you are changing right now. Everything changes you. So generally speaking, we're going to talk about three different types of learning. Now, these don't all, these don't occur in a singular track. There's uh, association uh, across all three of these domains and, and others as well. But we're going to talk about these these three, classical conditioning, operant conditioning, and cognitive learning. Now, what, what is learning relative is, is, is a relatively permanent change in behavior due to an experience. But now, uh, uh, you, you know, you learn to walk, you learn to speak, you learn what your mother's face look like and what your sibling's face look like. You, you learned what uh, uh, the, uh, what what your crib felt like. Now, do you remember that? No, probably not. But you did then, and and it wasn't uh, something where you took out a yardstick and measured it. Measured it. No, there was a different type of it. It's a sensorial and a somatic type of learning. But yet still, it's learning at any in in any case. <clears throat> Uh, these, the tight learning doesn't include uh, temporary changes because of disease, fatigue, injury, maturation, or drugs, obviously. <coughs> now, when we talk about associative learning, the, the formation of single associations among many different types of stimuli, and in fact, we have even a very large part of the cortical surface of our brain, which is called the uh, uh, associative cortex, and it associates uh, uh, learning uh, uh, and, and senses with, with uh, 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 motor operations as well. Cognitive learning is understanding, knowing, anticipating, making use of information. Uh, 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 co cognition also, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but cognition, i.e. thought, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, 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 thought in language. It can also mean images. So uh, uh, the, the learning and cognition is a, is a, a very complex area. Uh, uh, there are PhDs you can get in cognitive science. So uh, we're, we're just going to touch this area very, very lightly. So let's look at this types of learning. Classical conditioning to link two stimuli in a way that helps anticipate an event to which we have a reaction. Classical conditioning, think Pavlov's dog. And if you haven't learned, don't know what Pavlov's dog is, we'll talk about it in a few few minutes. Operant conditioning, yes, changing behavior choices and responses to consequences. And we'll talk about that as well. And then cognitive learning, and that's acquiring new behaviors and information through observation and information rather than by direct experience. In other words, when you watch TV and uh, 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 watch commercial, uh, that, that may very well uh, uh, in, influence you or at least influence the probability of you purchasing a certain product. Okay, so <clears throat> what are two types of, the, of associative learning? Classical conditioning and operant conditioning. 
uh, this, by the way, is definition time, right? Reinforcement, any event that increases the probability that a response will occur. Now, remember that. An event that increases the probability that a response will will recur. And that probability could be anywhere from 0.1% to, to, to 90% to 100% even. Uh, uh, antecedents are events that precede a response, come before a response. And this is much more important in classical conditioning that the antecedent, uh, uh, that the, the uh, uh, stimulus comes before. Uh, consequences are effects that follow a response, more important in operant conditioning. So let's look at some of these other uh, uh, differences. Uh, and, and, and then we'll go into specifically what each one, uh, what is, what each one is, classical, operant, so on. So <clears throat> under classical conditioning, these stimulus substitutes for another stimulus. And in operant, there's no substitution. In classical, one reinforcer elicits only one type of response. In other words, food leads to salivation. In operant conditioning, one reinforcer can be used to strengthen, strengthen a variety of responses. By that word, the term strengthen, what does that mean? That means increase the probability of a variety of responses. Money for lawn mowing, running, laps, so on and so forth. Under classical conditioning, emotions such as fear are associated with the autonomic nervous system. And this we're going to talk about quite a bit. In operant conditioning, responses associated with goal-seeking behavior are primarily involved and not the autonomic nervous system. That system responsible for our strong uh, emotions like fear. <clears throat> Under classical conditioning, it's a process by which an antecedent, or in other words, uh, an antecedent stimulus, something comes before, doesn't produce a response, uh, uh, that doesn't produce a response, is linked with one that does. So, uh, uh, in, in other words, uh, uh, food normally elicits salivation. A, a horn or a bell doesn't normally elicit salivation. In classical conditioning, however, we can re, uh, substitute uh, food for the sound of a bell, and that will elicit salivation. So that is uh, uh, Pavlovian conditioning, classical conditioning in a nutshell. Under operant conditioning, it is a process by which we increase the likelihood, the probability of a response. And, and, and that probability is influenced by the consequences of responding. And, and that probability could be even, can be increased via reinforcement, or in other words, or, or, or decreased via some form of punishment. OK, so under classical conditioning, uh, if Ivan Pavlov uh, was a Russian physiologist, not a psychologist, is a physiologist who studied digestion by presenting dogs with meat powder and then measuring salivation. And, and, and what he found was that uh, 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 when, when he and or one of his assistants came in to uh, 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 do the study, uh, if, a, if a sound was made prior to the presentation of the meat powder, uh, the dogs would start to salivate anyway. So therefore, the uh, uh, test animals had already associated uh, getting food with some sound. So that alerted them, hey, what's going on here? This was a reflex, a, a ref automatic, and now, now, by the way, I, I want to say reflex, here was just definition time. A reflex is an automatic unlearned response. So uh, something that's reflexive, you haven't you learned it. It's like hardwired. <clears throat> More definitions, Pavlovian terms. A neutral stimulus is a stimulus that does not evoke a response. So under just plain old neutral conditions, uh, out in the wilderness somewhere, uh, uh, a, a the sound of a bell, uh, if a dog hears the sound of a bell, dog's not going to salivate. A conditioned uh, stimulus is a stimulus that evokes a response because it has been repeatedly paired with an unconditioned stimulus, whereas the unconditioned stimulus is, 
is a stimulus that is an innate, innately capable of eliciting a response. Like food is innately capable of eliciting salivation. A bell is not. So under the Pavlovian model of conditioning, you can see here on the graph, <clears throat> we have an unconditioned stimulus, that is meat, and a conditioned stimulus, the bell. After we repair, pair uh, uh, the meat and the bell, then the bell itself, the bell itself, the sound of the bell will elicit salivation. Now, it is important here because this graph, this uh, graph here is slightly off. And that is that the uh, uh, bell, the sound of the bell has to precede, has to come before the meat, not after, before. If the, the uh, bell comes afterwards, that is not a stimulus. That is not a uh, conditioned stimulus. So, what is an unconditioned response? The unconditioned response is the innate reflex. It's a, it's a reflex. You smell something good and you're hungry, you're going to salivate. That's unconditioned. It's a re reflexive action. It's, an, it's, it's, it's part of your autonomic nervous system. A conditioned response would be just that. I'd learn response elicited by a conditioned stimulus. Now, you have to remember, this is powerful stuff. And over the decades... Uh, 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 along with media presentation and, and the use of, of, of graphics and other powerful psychological domains, uh, marketeers have been able to craft commercials that, that use uh, classical conditioning to, 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 to get you to salivate. Uh, you ever watch late night TV and you're hungry and you're sitting there and all of a sudden there's a big burger there and you start to salivate? That's Pavlovian conditioning and that's what the, uh, uh, the burger company is using to get you to buy a burger. <clears throat> so <clears throat> how do we get higher order or second order uh, uh, conditioning? Uh, 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 again, more definitions. Acquisition is a training period in conditioning when a response is strengthened. Respondent reinforcement is, occurs when the un, U.S. unconditioned stimulus, U.S. unconditioned stimulus, brings forth a response which becomes associated with the conditioned stimulus. Higher order conditioning is where the conditioned stimulus is used to reinforce further learning. So in other words, the conditioned stimulus is used as though it were an unconditioned stimulus. So then you can use now the bell then to, to reinforce yet something else. So now we've got a second order stimulus. The bell, however, is not as powerful a stimulus as the food was. So you go from the food to the bell to something else, to, to a buzzer or, or, or a puff of air or something. Now, <clears throat> for some time, Cognition wasn't considered to be an important factor in classical conditioning. Uh, uh, the, and, and only your bare, reflexive, uh, 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 autonomic nervous system. However, recently in, in, in studies, uh, it, it, there, there may very well be cognition associated in classical conditioning among uh, uh, humans. Uh, 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 and 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 to say and this is going to say unlike Pavlov, the psych, psychologists have recently begun to believe that classical conditioning involves some cognition uh, uh, because it's related to information that might aid survival. <clears throat> so organisms will look for associations among events. Plus, there's also expectancy, and expectancy is a cognitive process. So how are events interconnected? Now, once we learn something in classical conditioning, is it forever? Or in other words, once the uh, 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 a dog is now treated to uh, uh, the bell, 
uh, as the conditioned stimulus uh, for food. And so the, uh, the dog salivates. Now, if we take that, the dog and put it out, out in a completely neutral environment again and uh, 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 equip it with a, a remote speaker that, that sounds in its ear, and then we ring a bell, and we have a sensor that says, tells us how much it salivates, will it salivate the same amount every single time, hour after hour, day after day, week after week? Because you got to remember, it's out now in the middle of nowhere, and we're just monitoring it. And uh, eventually, because we're not feeding it, right? We just hit a, a remote button, and uh, a bell rings in its ear, and then we can uh, measure, uh, feed, to get the feedback, and see how much it salivates. And every single time, it's going to salivate less and less and less. And you know why? Because of what's there on the uh, slide in front of you. After a while, the dog will say, the hell with your bell, feed me. So what we have after a while is something called extinction. And it's the weakening of the condition response through removal of reinforcement. You can't do that forever. It eventually goes extinct. So unless it continues to be reinforced somehow, it will go extinct. In classical conditioning, however, there is something, something called spontaneous recovery, and it is a brief reappearance of a learned response following what appeared to be an extinction. It was an extinction. And you can get this reappearance of a learned, a learned response, and it goes away again. We also have something called stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. A stimulus generalization is the tendency to respond to stimuli that are similar but not identical to a, a conditioned stimulus. For, and for example, here is a, 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 a it will respond to a buzzer when the conditioning stimulus was started out to be a bell. Stimulus discrimination has to do with a learned ability to respond differently to different stimuli. In other words, in other words, the buzzer will cause the dog's dog to sit and the bell will cause the dog to salivate. So different bells, different sounds, different bells, alarms, boot school, timer, and so on. So here's an example of generalization, uh, 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 and, and it's a, a rather graphic one, but it's something that we see in psychology and in therapy quite often, and also the opposite as well. In this generalization example is a girl raped by her father uh, uh, came to fear all men. Now, we can see the exact reversal of that same situation as well, but that's a therapy issue, which uh, you may get into one of these days if you continue in psychology. <clears throat> By the way, this other uh, slide I want to, and, and I, I'm, uh, there's some detail here that I, I, I may or may not skip. For example, here, this discrimination, stimulus discrimination, you can see the dog here. Uh, 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 and and this this is a tuning fork and stimulus discrimination actually it can, can for for people who are into the research of stimulus discrimination it can become quite detailed and uh, dogs can discriminate between some fairly uh, close frequencies so in this example here uh, this tuning fork is tuning to tuned to something like uh, uh, 246 hearse and this is tuned to 382 hearse and the dog can discriminate between the two here there's salivation and here there's none okay more classical conditioning and in humans and this is something that we run into especially in uh, uh in in therapy and also uh, something that we treat and the treatments for phobia has become very very effective so what a phobia is a fear that persists even when no realistic danger exists. For example, a fear of, of, uh, of spiders is arachnophobia. Uh, a fear of heights is acrophobia. And uh, 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 so the, a conditioned emotional response is an learned emotional reaction to, to a previously neutral stimulus. 
uh, a, a, a height, for example, is really a neutral stimulus. Uh, an airplane is a neutral stimulus. A dog is a neutral stimulus. Unless you associate something positively or negatively to it, it remains a neutral stimulus. However, if there is especially a strong, powerful, negative uh, 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 emotion, otherwise called a trauma, associated with the stimulus, it remains neutral. If there is this trauma associated, like for example, uh, uh, you've suffered a serious dog attack, one may very well have a phobia with dogs. Uh, uh, if you uh, experienced, uh, while standing at an intersection, somebody tra tra uh, 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 tragically hit by a bus and flown 100 feet into the air, you may develop a trauma about that, and uh, uh, and and then a some curious phobia around that. So traumas and traumatic incidences not only lead to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, they also may very well lead to different types of phobias. Uh, that last item here, vicarious classical conditioning, and that is by watching, so learning to respond emotionally to a stimulus by observing others' emotional reactions. Indeed, uh, uh, that is something that we do quite frequently. There was a program that was on, it was on Comedy Central. He's gone now. I haven't seen him for a while. Uh, Tosh.0. Oh. And he showed some really gross uh, uh, videos to his audience. And then you, 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 he didn't show the video. He just, just watched the audience's reactions uh, to it. And, uh, uh, and, and so you can get, you can get a, a, an emotional reaction just by watching somebody else's reaction. So how do we overcome phobias? And this is something that, that uh, I do and I've gotten into qu to quite a bit using uh, virtual reality. One is through desensitization, and that is decreasing the fear anxiety by exposing phobic people to the stimuli. Or in other words, if you're afraid of spiders, we might then uh, 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 put you in virtual reality and very slowly uh, get you more custom uh, to spiders. Uh, uh, I will uh, include in this set a video, uh, a, a video that you can watch showing uh, a very, very uh, 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 skilled behavioral therapist who, uh, cognitive behavioral therapist who reduces a woman's fear of snakes uh, in, uh, the video is only maybe 30 minutes, but uh, the, the, her fear of snakes was quite, uh, uh, quite well reduced. <clears throat> Operant conditioning, also called instrumental con learning. Operant conditioning or instrumental learning. This is, this is based on the consequences of responding. And again, this is based upon increasing or decreasing the probability of a response, of a certain response. Now, it really started not so much with uh, Skinner, but with uh, Edward Thorndike and Edward, Edward Thorndike's law of effect, which is the probability of response is altered by the effect it has. So responses that lead to desired effects are repeated. Those that lead to undesired effects are not. An operant reinforcer is any event that follows a response and increases its likelihood of recurring. Follows a response now. Follows a response and increases its likelihood of recurring. Okay, so in acquiring an operant response, few more definitions, folks. A conditioning chamber, or what we now call a Skinner box, is an apparatus designed to study operant conditioning in animals. You see there on the lower right uh, of the screen, B.F. Skinner, uh, uh, 1904 to 1990. He was at uh, Harvard, I believe, uh, until he, he died. Uh, uh, animals actively emit they actively, we all, we're animals. We actively emit behaviors constantly, every second. Even if you're sitting still, if you're sleeping, you are emitting behavior. Consequences influence how frequently behavior occurs. 
Response contingent reinforcement is reinforcement given only after a desired response occurs. Only, only after a desired response occurs. And then when that response occurs, it will increase or decrease the likelihood of that response occurring. So operant reinforcement is most effective when given immediately after the correct response. So if a rat hits the hits the uh, 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 the the uh, square button instead of the round button, and you want the rat to, to discriminate between square and round, and hits the the square button, then the the uh, food pellet will drop out. And, and that increases the probability of the square versus the round. Now, of course, you would have to make certain that the organism in question can discern between uh, uh, round and square. That's important because that in and of itself is learned, especially uh, we learn to do that. Okay, response chaining is linked series of actions that leads to reinforcement. This is an important one as well, folks. Superstitious behaviors are behaviors that are repeated because they appear to produce reinforcement. Or in other words, the timing is right, even though they are not necessary. Shaping or uh, molding responses gradually in a step-by-step -step fashion to a desired pattern. And people who are very, very good at this instrumental learning at operant conditioning can, as you see in the bottom right corner of the screen, make have a raccoon uh, 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 shoot basketballs. Uh, shape, we can shape and sh learning to write is shaping. Uh, learning to play an instrument is really is shaping everything that we do. Driving, walking, speaking is shaping. Now, at some point or another, the level and skill to which that occurs is going to be determined by your environment. And that environment may be, uh, start out to be your family, your immediate environment, your community, the schools you go to, the universities, and so on. <clears throat> but successive approximations are ever closer matches. So imagine being a virtuoso pianist. Uh, at some time or another, uh, the excess successive approximations are, are to, to get better and better are going to only be like a, a fraction of a percentage better and better and better, whereas it, where the person began uh, uh, playing piano, the improvements uh, occurred in large percentages up until a certain uh, uh, age. Operant extinction, and extinction does occur when learned responses are not reinforced and they gradually fade away. They will, they do and will fade away. Negative attention seeking is using misbehavior to gain attention. And attention is a powerful, powerful reinforcer. So it's best to eliminate through the extinction of misbehavior and reinforcement of desired behavior. So now it's, you could say, hey, how, how I can't, negative misbehavior is very difficult to ignore. So you, because one would say, well, just if you want it to go away, let it go extinct, ignore it. And that's easier said than done. There are ways to do it. Uh, uh, naturally, if, if you've ever been to a child psychologist, uh, there are all kinds of ways to ignore uh, or, or to allow uh, negative or misbehavior to, uh, through extinction. Uh, one way is to not reinforce it to begin with, mis misbehavior starts misbehavior because somehow it was reinforced. Uh, uh, but at any rate, it is uh, uh, d difficult to do. I could go into ex into all the different ways in which uh, I I've seen this uh, uh, occur. Positive reinforcement is when a response is followed by a reward or other positive event. Negative reinforcement is when a response is followed by the removal of an unpleasant event. Now, I want to be really, really clear about something here. Negative reinforcement is not punishment. Negative reinforcement is that exactly what it is. It's reinforcement. It is taking something negative away. Have you ever gotten into your car? And the beeping starts, the beeping starts. And why? Because you haven't put your seatbelt on. And as soon as you put your seatbelt on, what happens? The beeping stops. What is that? That's negative reinforcement. It gets you to, to, 
to respond in a certain manner. It's, it is reinforcing. What it get, it got you to increases the probability of a certain behavior. What's the certain behavior? Putting your seatbelt on. When you have a headache, what do you do? You probably go and you take some aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol, whatever you take. And then, in most cases, the headaches go, goes away or at least reduced. That's negative reinforcement. If those analgesics, those pain relievers, didn't help you with the pain from the headache, you wouldn't take it. So we're, that is a negative reinforcer. When a child continuously cries, wanting, uh, let's say, a cookie, I want a cookie, and continuously, continuously engages in misbehavior for something that he or she wants, eventually the parent, the guardian, gives in, gives the child a cookie. Now the child is positively reinforced for that negative, for that misbehavior, and you are negatively reinforced. You are negatively enforced because the noise stops. The child is positively reinforced because the child got the cookie for eliciting a certain behavior. There's reinforcement going on in both directions. And these are the uh, uh, parent-child types of interactions that are very difficult to uh, uh, eliminate, but they are eliminate eliminatable. Then there is punishment. Now, punishment is not reinforcement. Punishment is any aversive consequence that follows a response and decreases the likelihood of it occurring, like a spanking. A response cost is the removal of a positive re reinforcer after a response is made, like somebody losing some, some privileges. You, you can't to use the internet for the next week, or you got to go to jail now for the next six months. Those are cost response costs. Do that, you you get eliminated from society. You go to a certain place, and we hold you there for a while, and then and watch you, and then you can go back out. That's a response cost, and and, and a punishment as well. But a punishment is a, direct and straight, like a spanking. Okay, so now here's a two by two graph or, or matrix showing you exactly what in pos in 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 uh, instrumental learning or, or or operant conditioning what we're talking about. So over here, where we have in, to increase the chance of behavior reoccurrence, you could have a positive reinforcement, or you can have a negative reinforcement, or in other words, something negative, something that annoys you, something that bothers you, gets removed. If if you can do something to get that negative that negative uh, stimulus removed, you're going to do it. That increases that behavior. Same thing here. If if you if certain responses uh, uh, get you something that you like, that's that's reinforcement. To decrease the chance of a behavior reoccurrence, direct punishment or a response cost, removing something that you like. Now, notice these two are opposite. Here's removing something that you like. Here's removing something that you don't like. So negative reinforcement is removing something that you don't like. Negative punishment is removing something that you like. So operant reinforcers are unlearned, and natural. They, 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 what we're talking about is anything in the organism's environment. So a, a primary reinforcer is something that's natural, and it satisfies physiological needs like food and water and sex. Uh, uh, we can do with, with, as you can see here in the uh, uh, graph, you can see right there a little intracranial uh, electrode connected to this mouse. And uh, th this intracranial stimulation produces a, a natural, I mean, it is, this, is, this is the most natural primary reinforcer. It's going to where food would normally go to. Uh, this involves direct activation of the brain's pleasure centers. And believe me, by, if we go to this versus food, if you activate that mouse's pleasure center uh, uh, with, with one lever, let's say a green lever, and the uh, uh, blue lever or the red, let's say the red lever gives the mouse food, 
and the blue lever gives the mouse a stimulation of that electrode into its pleasure center. What do you think the mouse will hit most? That mouse will starve to death hitting the pleasure center. Secondary reinforcers are learned reinforcers. For example, money. Why do you go to work? Why do you come to school? What, or what, what is the motivation behind being in this course? You need certain grades, a certain course, a certain number on a transcript in order to move or continue to move further. These are secondary reinforcers. Approval, great job, or praise. These are all secondary types of reinforcers, and they have reinforcing properties by associate, they, they associate themselves with the primary reinforcer. So there are other types of reinforcers like token reinforcers or tangible secondary reinforcers. We use these a lot in uh, 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 mental health clinics. Uh, especially in uh, state mental hospitals, uh, uh, the patients get uh, 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 tokens for uh, 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 certain behavior or, or in not engaging in certain behaviors over a period of time. And with that, they can buy, uh, well, it used to be cigarettes, but cigarette, they'd go to the, the, the local, uh, to the the canteen in in the hospital and they could buy cigarettes, but no more uh, uh, candy and, and soft drinks and what have you. Uh, social reinforcers are attentional and approve, approval by other people. Uh, think adolescence. Uh, this becomes a primary, primary behavioral reinforcer uh, during uh, uh, late childhood and adolescence. <clears throat> so what are some of the types of feedback? It's information about the effect the effect of a response. So uh, uh, when we have knowledge of results, it's feedback about whether the response or, was right or wrong, knowledge of the correct response, elaboration feedback. We're talking about the different types of feedback that we occur. And notice that these things are becoming more and more cognitive in, 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 uh, in, in thinking. <clears throat> Learning aids. This has become, uh, uh, learning aids have become more and more popular in, uh, in, in the, the latter half of the 20th century, and certainly now as we are almost one quarter into the 21st century. Programmed instruction uh, is learning format that presents information in small amounts and gives immediate practice. I'm sure many of you, many of us, uh, have have used uh, uh, computer learning models to learn uh, 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 different things. And, you know, you get a little piece on the computer and uh, on a computer. And then after that, it asks you a couple questions uh, about it. And then it gives you some reinforcers, some praise, hey, great job. Or it may minimize uh, if you get one wrong and then says, okay, try again. Uh, uh, now, games... And I got to tell you something. I'm a a computer game uh, aficionado. I love computer games, and I've played them almost as long as they've been around, uh, all the way from EverQuest through World of Warcraft, and now from almost everything you can think of. <clears throat> anyway, serious games are uh, are presented in a uh, 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 game format. Uh, educational simulation, uh, imaginary uh, situations for micro worlds that simulate real real world problems. Uh, I play uh, uh, quite a few games uh, all the time. Uh, in fact, I just had a just had an idea. So I took the uh, I took the time to uh, start up one game that I play. I've played this for a long time. It's called Witcher Three. And uh, here's the, the the main character. He's got quite a few cast quests to uh, to go through, but he um, right now he needs to go and find um, he also needs to make sure that he has plenty of food uh, moving around. He's got. Uh, 
and 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 there's he's got a quest. It says here, find the spirit that haunts the well. So he has to go out out and and do this. Uh, this is an entire uh, a world here. I'm going to show you. Um, he's in this area here, but uh, he could go to uh, uh, this huge expanses he's got. Uh, he's back here in White Orchard. Uh, this Nov Novigrad is a, is a city that he can go into. And so on. So I took that little brief uh, uh, sidetrack just to show you why are games good for learning, or there are so many different types of, of games that, that have rewards, mastery, uh, uh, engagement, uh, uh, increasing concentration and focus, uh, flow, uh, 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 the, not, not just to, to mention hand-eye coordination. Uh, all of these areas fit into the, the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, best and most optimal uh, methods for, for learning. Um, <clears throat> some more definitions, reinforcement of uh, schedule reinforcement, uh, continuous reinforcement is that the reinforcer follows every single correct response. Every single correct response you get a reinforcer. Partial reinforcement is a reinforcer follows only some responses. Uh, uh, partial reinforcement effect is that the reinforcements acquired with partial reinforcement are more resistant to extinction more resistant to extinction. You may realize that, that some of the behaviors that we learn, especially the bad ones, the ones that we would rather not have, are more resistant, are harder to get rid of than others. What is that? So what, these are based upon what are called partial reinforcement schedules. So the, the, the harder ones, the, the, the ones that are most problematic, are, are usually the ones that have been uh, established through some, at, at that point, at the point that we picked them up, unknown variable ratio schedule. So let's talk about ratio schedules and, and just uh, 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 reinforcement schedules in general. A fixed ratio schedule is a set number of correct responses that must be made uh, in order to uh, obtain a reinforcer, a set number of correct responses. So you have you have uh, 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 five correct responses. Boom, you get a reinforcer. Five respect. Boom, a reinforcer. Five more. Boom, a reinforcer. A variable ratio, however, schedule is a varied number of correct responses within a certain range that have to be made to get a reinforcer. So, in other words, uh, you 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 have. Uh, two correct responses, boom, you get a reinforcer. The next time you have five correct responses, not two, but five, you get a reinforcer, boom. So then you keep going and going, and now you've got uh, seven re before you get, boom, and then you get uh, one reinforcer, and then you get a response, and so on. So va variable uh, 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 ratio, variable ratio schedules. So fixed ratio schedule, variable ratio schedule. So uh, an example of a variable ratio schedule would be something like playing a slot machine or fishing. A fixed interval schedule is an interval of reinforcer that given only when a correct response is made after a set amount of time has passed, like your paycheck. Fixed interval, boom, you get a reinforcer. Fixed interval, boom. Fixed interval, boom. So if you're on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly payment interval, then that's when the reinforcer is, is, is established as a fixed interval reinforcer. It's the easiest one to go extinct. Variable interval reinforcers include reinforcers that are given for the first correct response made after a varied amount of time has passed since the last reinforced response. So a variable reinforced schedule might be a, a, a pop quiz. I mean, a, an interval may go where uh, uh, two weeks is gone without a quiz, and then all of a sudden you get one, and then you get one the next day. So that would be variable reinforcement. Fixed reinforcement, like I said, a paycheck every two weeks or whatever. Okay, so operant conditioning, reinforcement schedules. Let's look at them all. 
a continuous reinforcement schedule is given uh, after each desired behavior. Uh, it is uh, 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 the fastest at learning the new behavior, but uh, uh, it, it, you could get a, experience very rapid ex extinction. Like, for example, compliments. If you get too many compliments, eventually uh, they're, they're meaningless after a while from the same person, especially. It means that what, what's this, this is too much. What's this person up to? Uh, a fixed interval uh, schedule. Uh, rewards given in a fixed time interval, like a paycheck. Uh, variable interval schedules. Rewards are given at variable time intervals, like pop quizzes. So you get moderately to high stable performance with very slow extinction. Uh, whereas that fixed interval, like I said earlier, was is very rapid extinction. Uh, fixed ratio, however, uh, 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 fixed ratio is reward given a fixed amount of time. Let's say you're an envelope stuffer. You got to have a hundred envelopes uh, or a thousand envelopes stuffed before you get your whatever you get. So uh, like every three liver presses or every 1,000 envelopes stuffed or whatever. A variable ratio schedule is reward given at variable at variable. Uh, amounts of output. Uh, so this is a very high performance with very slow extinction. Very, very, very slow uh, uh, extinction. Which is why uh, uh, gambling addictions are among any, actually any addiction is very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to uh, go extinct. Uh, but gambling uh, is a more of a, a strictly behavioral uh, uh, type of, of addiction. And, and indeed, it's, it's quite difficult to go extinct, but it can, and you can, and it will, and you, you can do it. Uh, stimulus control. <clears throat> Stimuli that can consistently precede a rewarded response tend to influence when and where the response will occur. Operant stimulus generalization is a tendency to respond to stimuli similar to those that preceded the operant reinforcement. And operant stimulus discrimination, remember we talked about discrimi di stimulus discrimination when we talked about classical conditioning. So operant stimulus discrimination occurs when one learns to differentiate between antecedent discriminative stimuli that signal either an upcoming reward or a non-reward condition. Punishment. A punisher is any consequence that reduces the frequency of a target behavior. Severe punishment is intense punishment capable of suppressing a, a response for a long time. Uh, and mild punishment is a weak punishment, usually slow responses temporarily. A mild punishment might be, you kids stop all that noise in there. And then it stops for a while, and then it starts again. Uh, severe punishments, uh, not so good. Maybe we'll we'll talk about that. So what 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 is the downside of punishment? Well, first of all, let's talk about some of the punishing stimuli. Aversive stimulus is a stimulus that's painful or uncomfortable. Like a shock, for example, we, uh, 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 shocks are used in uh, uh, certain behavioral uh, uh, therapies to to uh, uh, and it's called a, a aversive therapy. Uh, so, or in other words, let's say you take a you, you take a puff of a cigarette and you get a shock. So now the pain of the shock is is associated with the puff of the cigarette. Uh, uh, we learned eventually that we didn't have to use a shock, just a little slop of a rubber band on your wrist. If you just carry a, have a little rubber band around your wrist, and every time you even have a craving, you pull the rubber band back. And so what that does is it pairs just a slight bit of, of pain, that little bit of, of painful stimulus with the craving of wanting a cigarette. So reversive stimulus doesn't necessarily have to be uh, 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 like uh, extremely excruciating. It could just be a slight little little tap, like a you know a little rubber band uh, snap. Uh, escape learning is learning to make a response uh, uh, to end an aversive stimulus. 
So in other words, you, you, if, if the aversive stimulus is going on, uh, you need to learn something to make that stop. Whereas avoidance learning is learning to make a stimulus, uh, to make a response, I mean, to avoid or postpone or prevent the discomfort, like not going to the doctor or dentist or, 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 or not coming to class. The worst would be like not coming to class because you know that there's going to be an exam today. But unfortunately, you also know that there's no makeup exam. So that's not a good decision either. But we do a lot of avoidance learning uh, uh, and, and, and uh, if if you weren't good at your avoidance learning, uh, uh, then you're going to have to do some escape learning as well. Uh, uh, punishment also may very well, and often does, and I've seen it uh, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a clinician. I've seen it increase aggression. I've seen it as a clinician. I've just seen it as a regular human being living and growing up where I lived and grew up. Punishment increases aggression. I mentioned to you uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, aversive counterconditioning, aversive conditioning, and this is a type of counterconditioning that associates an unpleasant taste with an unwanted uh, behavior, and that can and sometimes does with things like drinking or other addictions. So that are, they're they're very complex and they're associated with all kinds of of cognition, uh, not uh, and, and learned events, not necessarily targeted in the specific behavior that we use in a particular treatment. So we may get somebody to uh, 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 be sick or throw up as a smell or sight of alcohol. But then given another context, that individual may in fact completely forget that therapy and, and, and start drinking anyway. So a lot of these therapies don't take into account the multitude of associations that we as humans have, especially when we want to guard our addictions. How can you use punishment wisely? Certainly avoid harsh punishment. Minimize, minimize uh, uh, spanking. Uh, uh, use the minimum punishment necessary to suppress misbehavior. Uh, apply punishment during immediately and immediately after the misbehavior. Don't wait and say, you just wait till your father comes home. No, 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 no. Never, never say that. Be consistent with your punishment. Use counter conditioning. Expect anger from the punished person. And I, I know this is a... a, a, a somewhat counterintuitive, but punish with uh, kindness and respect. Now, we've talked about classical conditioning. We've talked about operant uh, conditioning or instrumental learning. Now, let's talk about cognitive learning. Cognitive learning is a higher level type of learning that involves thinking, knowing, understanding, anticipating, expecting, a cognitive map is an internal uh, uh, is a map of internal images or other mental representations of an area. Now, remember, so cognition can mean more than just uh, 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 a lot of people think that cognition just means thought, like words or language. No, you can have you can have uh, uh, pictorial cognition as well, or uh, uh, so image cognition or other mental representations of an area that underlie an ability to choose alternate paths to the same goal. And here's another uh, interesting aspect of, of cognition, something called latent learning. And latent learning occurs without obvious reinforcement, and it's not demonstrated or is hidden until reinforcement is provided. Or in other words, it's, it's there, and if the right catalyst comes along, then it will be demonstrated. But uh, before that, it, there's no response. Then there's discovery, the discovery learning, so rote learning, which is the most basic kind of learning. It takes place mechanically through repetition and memorization and practice and rehearsal and uh, by learning a set of rules. Discovery learning is based on insight and understanding, and it is a higher set, a higher type of learning. Okay, so rote learning is still important. You know, you, you memorize your, whatever you're going to memorize, it's still important. 
is very important sometimes in studying. But what I always try to get students to do is to do the rote learning last. Do the discovery learning first. Then the rote learning will fall right in. But if you just do rote learning first, the discovery learning probably won't happen. And then you really won't understand, you won't own what you've learned. It just becomes another one of those things that you've memorized and forgotten. So when we talk about observational learning, or in other words, we're still talking about cognitive learning, Albert Bandura is, was, was, is, is noted as uh, the same as, as, as Pavlov or, or, or Thorndike or, or Skinner with uh, 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 classical and operant conditioning, Albert Bandura is considered uh, the, the uh, uh, icon when it comes to uh, cog cognitive learning, observational learning, and modeling. He created modeling theory with the uh, classic Bobo doll inflated uh, doll experiments, which I will have you uh, uh, watch. Uh, it's also on your, your list of things to view. Uh, observational learning occurs by watching and imitating actions of another person or by noting consequences of a person's actions. So this occurs before, before direct practice is allowed. Before direct practice is allowed. Okay? You observe before you practice. A model is someone who serves as an example in observational learning. Your mother was a model, your father is a model, your, your siblings are models, your friends are models, uh, uh, the people you see on TV and on your computer screen and on your smartphone screen and on your Instagram. I mean, those are all, all, all models for your learning. And you make the decision as well you wanted to learn it or not, but they are models for your learning. So down in the lower left-hand corner, you see Albert Bandura, Observational Learning. There are five stages of modeling, of learning. This is, this is how we learn. Almost everything through these five stages. Attention, retention, reproduction, motivation, reinforcement. Let's go through those again. Attention, retention, that's holding it. Reproduction, doing it again. Motivation, do you want to do it? And reinforcement, being reinforced or in other words, getting some uh, 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 positive juice in order to do it again. That's what you need for the reinforcement. So as you see in the lower right-hand corner there, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the boy is, is, uh, is imitating his father shaving. Uh, 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 the girl there is, is pulling her, her suitcase behind her dad. So what's, what are some of the steps to successful modeling? Obviously, you want to pay attention to a model. Now, uh, uh, the old school learning, you know, when you go to a class and you sit there and somebody gets, stands up on, on, in the front with a lecture, a lectern, and, and lectures to you uh, 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 for history or psychology or math or whatever, I mean, in a way, that, that's a model in and of itself. Uh, 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 it's not necessarily, it's a very general model, though. It's not necessarily what you need to aspire to uh, for that. And, and aspiration, what is aspiration? It's motivation. It's a form of motivation. Um, <clears throat> but you do have to pay attention to the model. Now, what, what do we use? What does media use? I mean, media is really good at this. Movies are really good at this to get you to pay attention to the model because the model is going to then present you with a message and they want you to listen to this message. So pay attention to the model. Remember what was done. Then the observer has to be able to reproduce the model behavior. If a model is successful or his, her behavior is rewarded, the behavior is more likely to reoccur. So as you see here, this modeling is a, is a, is a cycle, a circle, 
Sometimes it can even be a vicious circle. You can see there a person or thing that is considered an excellent example of something. That's a model. Model consists of four components. Process, retention, reproduction, motivation. Actually, five. It describes the process of learning or acquiring new information, skills, or behavior through observation. So, what is self-managed behavioral behavioral uh, 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 therapy or change? What are the principles behind that? So if you if you want to manage your your yourself, if give yourself therapy, what what is it? Now, one thing that's very difficult about about self therapy is that you're biased. And the problem and 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 the the process of therapy is is one where you need to have a completely unbiased person. That's why your therapist can't be your friend. That's why therapy from a friend doesn't work. And that's why your own therapy probably is not going to be as effective as getting a real therapist. But self-managed behavior therapy still has a, a huge audience and it works sometimes. Depends upon behavior. In fact, everything depends upon what it is. Context. Remembers that. Context. Choose the target behavior. Record a baseline. Record a baseline. How often is it done? Now, that in and of itself is going to introduce bias. When you record your own baseline, you are going to, oh, I'm recording my own baseline. Let me get it as low or as high as possible. Establish your goals. Choose your reinforcers. Record your progress reward your successes, and adjust your plan as you learn more about your behavior. Maybe you can get a friend or somebody to do this for you. Uh, there's something called the PREMAC principle. It's, it's, it's a fun and, 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 and easy principle, and that is any high-frequency response can be used to reinforce a low-frequency response. Or in other words, no video game until you finish your homework. Also engage in self-recording. That is self-management based on keeping records of response frequencies. Now, I, you know, whatever, whatever your, your thing is out there, maybe it's studying, uh, uh, maybe it's working toward a new a job, a new career. Maybe you want to go further in, in academia. Maybe you're, you're working on your bachelor's. If you're taking this course, you're probably working on your bachelor's degree or AA. Then maybe you want to get a master's degree, maybe you're a PhD. Maybe you want to be a therapist one of these days. But if that's the case, then you have a number of smaller goals to reach before you get to the big, big, big goal. The PREMAC principle reinforces low probability behavior like studying with a high probability behavior like, uh, well, we're adults, so whatever a high probability behavior is for an adult. Oh, here's a good one. How do we break bad habits? <clears throat> one, one, and again, this goes back to where we were, self-managed behavioral principles. How do we break bad habits? And again, self-managed behavioral therapy. Try alternate responses. Get the same reinforce, reinforcement for the new response. Of course, bad habits are also uh, many times based upon some type of a uh, negative or fringe uh, 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 behavior that may very well uh, you can't get you can't get the, the the response that you would normally get anyway with another response. But try this: try, try to get the same reinforcement with a new response. Remember, extinction works. It it is it is true. Extinction. Try to discover uh, uh, what is reinforcing uh, an unwanted response and remove, avoid, or delay the reinforcement. Uh, uh, response chains uh, uh, scramble the chain of events that can lead to undesired responses. There are cues and antecedents. Try to avoid, narrow down, or remove a stimuli that elicits a bad habit. I mean, if 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 you don't want to go into bars, try, try to go around areas, stay away from areas that have bars that you like. There's also something called behavioral contracting. We get into this a lot in therapy. I'll get a lot of this off, for example, let's say if you're a suicide uh, 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 response, 
uh, uh, therapist or on hotline. So a behavioral contract is a formal agreement stating behaviors to be changed and consequences that apply. It is, it is a written contract. State the rewards that you, you get and privileges that you forfeit or punishments that you have to accept if the uh, 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 contract is, is broken or achieved. And, and type the contract. It's a, it's a serious, serious formal legal contract. Sign it and get a person you trust to sign it. And then corroborate it. So that is the uh, uh, end of, of our uh, lesson for, for this time uh, on, on learning and cognition. And uh, you know, again, I, I really don't like to, to, to just give the subjects this topical uh, uh, exposure that, w that we do, but you, 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 once you're exposed to these things, you'll learn then what particular area that you love. I love it all. So uh, uh, I've, I've just gotten into as much as possible. But, you know, you, you look at it and, and, uh, uh, and see what you like for yourself. So we, we've gotten now studied another big area in psychology, and that is uh, cognition and learning.